a pleasure this time around to meet somebody that I haven't crossed paths with yet, uh, living in Albury, Wodonga, and having grown up here, I find it very surprising. Frank Homan, how are you today? Oh, I'm very well. Thanks for having me here. Now, we've had a chat before we got started here on this month's journey. Uh, you're well known for being a swimming coach locally, but you, uh, you sort of wonder whether you wasted some of your life at university because you're actually a teacher by profession. I am, I am, and uh, that goes back uh, over 35 years and uh, I ended up being known as a coach, which I find quite amazing <laughs> when you can do a weekend course and you can, uh, you know, be lucky, people walk in the gate, happen to be committed, and away you go. Yeah, so Frank, let's talk about um, your history with Albury Wodonga. Uh, you didn't grow up here. What brought you to Albury Wodonga? Yeah, we have to go back a little bit further. Well, I think we have to go all the way back to the fatherland. I was born in Germany yeah. in late 1940. Um, my uh, father was nine years in the German Navy on u boat we kind of made a decision in 1954 to migrate. It, it became a choice between Canada and coming out here, and the letter to out here came before Canada. Therefore, we ended up in early 1954 at Bonagilla. Okay. By that time, I'd be, I would be—I would have been about 12, 13 years of age, uh, little English, uh, and um, I can only say when we hit Bonagilla, my life in a way came together in the form of I, I just love the outdoor and Bonagilla and Wodonga has always been passionate in my heart and that is why after going teaching I came back here. Okay so um, to get your teaching qualification and what have you yep. where did that career lead you to before Aubrey Wodonga? I went to Hopeton, got married in Hopeton in the Mallee, played 54 games of AFL, <laughs> uh, enjoyed that too uh, after that, went back to Warrnambool to teach, um, then Geelong a little while, and then my I had a decade there in the 1970s when I wanted to get back to Germany, back to Europe. And I went to England for two years, and uh, 1975 and 78, I went back to Germany to teach. Okay. So let's talk about the coaching, the thing that you are best known for. You've coached some pretty high-profile swimmers that have come out of this area, haven't you? Well, I keep on telling, when people do ask me that, I keep mentioning the point how, how fortunate I've been to have that golden decade. And uh, coaching, look, I can have Don Talbot down here, Michael Phelps, co Coach Bowman, can have him on pool deck. If that committed, determined, dedicated young person doesn't walk in the gate, it doesn't matter how good you are. And 1995 to about 2005, we've just had four, five, ten people walk in the gate who were at national level. Yeah. And, and obviously what happened to me, then I had to go and get a bit of education again. So how do you become a swimming coach? Do you have to be an exceptional swimmer yourself beforehand? Mm. <laughs> no, actually, no, no, you don't have to be. Um, look, for me, coaching is an extension of teaching where normally when you're teaching in a high school you've got a level age of child 12 30 40 whatever up to year 12 and you teach all the same age what i enjoyed in coaching was having them from go to woe meaning they come in at 8 9 10 11 12 whatever and therefore you've got that kaleidoscope of mixture of personalities and interest and motivation and i've always enjoyed that and the fact i was outdoors loved outdoors and um yeah, it evolved. It, it evolved from there. So, uh, some of the names that you've coached, uh, there's some pretty big ones. Go through, I guess, the the ones that you've maybe been proudest of, or have managed yeah, to yeah. see to go on and get some medals. The one that uh, encouraged me to go a little bit further in my coaching development uh, was Jacinta Van Lint, and Jacinta made the national team about 1995 when she was doing year 12. When you have an athlete on the national team, you as a coach get invited in long. And from that, the learning begins. Ian Thorpe's coach was there, yeah. for example, and we got to know, you know, Dougie fairly well. And there were other people and they share information with you. And that becomes part of your learning. So you don't have to have that little ticket in your back pocket all the time. You depend on mentors. You depend on people who can help you. Jacinta... And she went on, and um, after she left here, and, and that's another one of my ideas, and that you can't coach an elite athlete 
on their own when you've got a commitment to a team of about 30, 40, 50 other people in the mm-hmm. club. Not fair on mum and dad who pay a bill and not fair on the child. You won't be able to devote all your attention to them. So at 18, when I finished year 12, Jacinta went off to the AOS. Mind you, she had already made the Pan Pack team. So it wasn't that I didn't take her actually to the Olympics and that. I wouldn't have got a Guernsey anyway. I only had one athlete there. Oh, no, I didn't. I had to. Anyway, yeah, and from then on, um, next one on the block, Clementine walked in the door, Clementine Stoney. And she was committed from the day one. By commitment, I mean she had uh, Jack or John, her dad, who uh, I believe in the 1950s was a fairly high-profile athlete. And, uh, and she wanted to emulate what, you know, dad had done. Uh, from then on, it, I had a um, disabled girl, young Diana Lay, and Diana, who had lost half a leg in, in, on a farming accident in Bictalangula, came along at about 11, 12 years of age. And uh, wow, what a determined young lady. And we've, we won world championship with her, went to Paralympics and so on. Mm. Uh, after that, uh, you think, oh, well, <laughs> the demise is coming. You're now back to people who are only half committed or don't want to do it competitively. Along came Belinda Hocking. And mm. Belinda Hocking from Wangaratta, um, twice a day, 250k a day. Now there's commitment for you. You know you're on a winner. Yeah, well, you, you've mentioned in there a couple of times commitment, maybe a bit of desire. Yeah, yeah. When I think swimming, I instantly think early mornings, long times going up and down a straight line painted or tiled into the bottom of a pool. Mm. It doesn't exactly sound like something yeah. to make most people excited. Um, what level of commitment do these guys show? Um... Yeah, look, a good question. I, I look at if I look at me and watch the black line and watch these young people go up and down, come out, and still jump for joy. You think I could do? I could not do that. And yet, the correlation between an, a top athlete and a high-profile academic job or career is very high. There have been a number of studies done and people tell me, doctors and lawyers that, you know, that have come to Ori Wodonga pool and whatnot, they always say, it allows me to turn off Mm -hmm. in the pool. From From a young person's point of view, to get up at five in the morning, and I'll make a point of that quite often to them when I give my little motivational talk at the beginning of a workout, and I say to them, look, you guys gave up, you know, early morning gave up a few hours sleep and whatever and therefore I admire you for that now when you come here and do that you've got to give me 100% yeah and and that that becomes then part of the uh, the theme if you like of a of a team of a club how do you think other people would describe you Frank Homer <laughs> yeah interesting I've heard a number of things <laughs> if you want to give me a compliment and I hear that a lot they talk about passionate mm-hmm and I love that. I mean, I feel good if I'm passionate. And passion involves a number of behaviours, if you like. I'm a fairly loud coach. I work in an outdoor environment. Okay, that mean, And I'm a teacher too. I mean, you do have to yell occasionally. Okay. So the word passionate means also commitment. And people know that. Um, I always quote the fact that after 35 years of teaching, uh, I had about 450 days owing to me on sick days, which means I have been f- more than fortunate of enjoying good health. Mm. And I've never hardly missed a day, and that applied to pool work. I go there nine times a week, uh, five mornings, four evenings, weekend competition, and I doubt, other than being on national teams, I doubt whether I've ever missed a session. I remember coming back from a championship uh, at, um, at, from Homebush and uh, I left about 11 o'clock at night. I was on pool deck at 5.30 in the morning. You know, that my personal values. I've been people, I'd like to think I'm compassionate. I like to think I understand people and an athlete. People, maybe because of my Germanic background, sometimes believe that I'm a little bit arrogant in what I do. I call it I'm a little bit shy. <laughs> I like to think I'm knowledgeable because I have I do work very hard whether at uni whether I'm in teaching preparing and whatever I like to I like to know where I'm going I'm not a person who can walk on pool deck say oh gee what will I do today hmm. I'm planned I've got a whole week planned I've got a month planned I've got a season planned I've got a long term plan and do you think planning is part of your success definitely definitely 
I think it shows um, your, your athlete has confidence in you when you, when you do that. What do you do with your spare time? <laughs> it I sounds do. like you've spent many hours working and doubling mm. up. Mm. Um, what's downtime for you look like? A good book, a bit of television and plenty of walking. We, we build my wife and I, and I'm fortunate uh, in having a person as a partner who, uh, who does believe in movement. If you don't lie on the couch, uh, you know, and flick on the remote and that. I like to keep busy. I'm a passionate gardener, using that word again. Mm. Look, I help out. I'm, I'm at Wodonga again at the moment, just helping out. I come over to Wayne Gould, Albury coach. Uh, I've been to North Albury. And then I have, uh, I've been fortunate. I've had a lot of international gigs. I had two years in Singapore coaching and as a matter of fact and I need to mention that the boy who beat Michael Phelps in the 100 fly was in the team I coached oh wow yeah and he you know he only got one million dollars I think for winning <laughs> yeah. being a coach you would have known about no doubt uh, read or been exposed to some great advice or motivational quotes what's a great quote or philosophy or sort of mantra that you like to instill not just in yourself yes. but in, yeah. in those that you coach there's only one for me and it's not no pain, no gain, and all the things that you hear coaches talk all the time. Um, for me, Calvin Coolidge in the 1920s, American president, as you well know, made a very famous quote. He was, the man was actually full of quotes, and one of them, nothing in the world can take the place of persistence and perseverance. Talent will not. Genius will not. Education will not. Only one thing can help you to achieve your goal and these are my words now yeah. and that is perseverance Sticks in other up. words in our adage in our language you say oh have a go mate <laughs> and conclusion of that keep going keep going you never know how you're going to end up and that in a way is my dictum is what i live by you've got to keep going keep going doesn't matter how hard it is you have a bit of time off come back you know and that to me, is the development of a teenager and gives me the greatest joy when they get, you know, get to an end. And that may be national team, maybe Olympics, maybe like I've got a lot of young people now, who uh, who say, oh gee, I'm so happy, you know, for whatever we did in the pool when I was a teenager, and that to me is reward enough. Mm. And you said passion is probably mm. a word people would use to describe you. Passionate. Mm -hmm. What do you consider to be your biggest achievement in life so far? Oh, there's no doubt about that. Easy. I've got a family, three lovely daughters, seven grandchildren, well-adjusted, good people, good citizens, have done well in life and so on. And uh, to me, there's no... I mean, part of having family is to ensure that they also uh, have a path where they find fulfilness the magic word happiness, if you like, you know. And I think my wife and I have achieved that. And that is the greatest achievement. On the other hand, a personal achievement is what I've alluded to before. And that is, look, there is no greater joy for a person when somebody asks you, I need you. <laughs> and I, you, I need you to help me with, whether it be in education and how many after four o'clock hours I've had with the year 12, year 11 students and that, you know? Just putting in an hour, half an hour, and then at the end to get that little magic thank you card. So they're, you know, they're, they're, they're tiny things, but for me, that has given me the greatest joy. You've obviously followed a few different paths in life, followed different opportunities. Any regrets from maybe opportunities you didn't take, or do you grab everything and, and make the most of it? Yeah, you, you make me think about that question. I got keen on the share market, mm. okay, when I came out of uni. And uh, a guy, an economics teacher, a teacher actually, um, you know, showed me the layout and how it all worked and what it all meant and whatever. When I went to London, I applied for a job. The old chalky mm. up on the board? I applied for one of that and got the job. A week later... Um, I also wanted to go to Germany, my homeland. I wanted to go back. I've got a bit of family left over there. And uh, I took the teaching job in Germany. And I, I quite often wondered, you know, what would have happened? Was I chasing money? And maybe it wouldn't have been fulfillment. I may have been a multimillionaire, but you know what I mean? But I don't know whether it would have given me the same outcome and joy that I've got now.
Mm. But it's a question. It's later. a question, yeah. <laughs> and then, look, there are many journeys that we all take. You know, opportunities come up and you, you take them and whatever. Maybe if I'm being a deputy, I should have moved on and gone, you know, higher in education. But I've more, I, I like teaching more. I like to be with young people. Mm. And I've been with them all my life, and that won't change. Did you plan to have achieved what you've achieved? Did you ever think you were going to be a swimming coach? No, never. I've played a lot of them in sport. Um, Golf in Warrnambool, and probably see my name up on the honour board there for some junior golf championship, uh, one tennis championship down there. I went heavily into canoeing. Um, I've had, you know, I've, I've done whatever you could do, I've done. Played AFL football, got a couple of uni blues for playing soccer. Um, no, and then all of a sudden I ended up in the pool. So nothing planned. Um, it was more a question of... When we came to Wodonga, I can remember a conversation with my wife and, and I said, oh, now that I'm a teacher again, not a deputy, I think I'd like to have something to do. And I thought of, maybe I'll go back to the fatherland, you know, and work in the German Austrian club or whatever, you know, we'd come on the committee and do all that, rah, 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 bit, you know, <laughs> the shooting gallery down below and that. I didn't get far with that. And then I ended up in pool deck because my daughters wanted to join the club. We did, and young Anna, a little five-year-old at the time, showed enormous talent. And I said, gee, you know, the, the coach had walked out after about a year. Steve Mamouni would tell you that. And, uh, yeah, and I said, well, I'd better help out and just go and be on pool deck and say, do this and do that. And from that it evolved, and kids won medal, went to Melbourne, and I won the butterfly, I think, as a seven-year-old, you know, and, and whatever. And I thought, oh, I should know a little bit more. And then I began my journey as a coach. You've spoken about fulfilment a couple of times. Um, would you say the coaching or the teaching has created more of that for you? More coaching than teaching. I think in coaching you have more of an input I mean, I, I, ha I have a student between nine and four, where in coaching, yes, I have the morning and night, but after that comes, that come different factors, and that is you become involved in the family. You take them over the weekend to competition. Mm -hmm. you, you, you become more of a personal mentor, and I'm, one of my fundamental beliefs is people, young people should have a mentor, and maybe it shouldn't be mum and dad, it may be your coach. It may be an uncle and aunt, and that to me is important. Therefore, I, I always have encouraged you know, people to have a mentor, just to guide you along the path. Mm -hmm. And I think I'd like to think I've mentored quite a few young people. With the benefit of hindsight, which is always perfectly clear, 2020 mm -hmm. vision, <laughs> <laughs> what yeah. advice would you give your younger self? Have a go, keep going. No. <laughs> <laughs> I wish... In, in a lot of ways, when, when we came out, and I know there's a big issue in, in bullying, there's a big issue in, in society. When we came out, I mean, a heavily accented young German kid came here and, and so on, and there was a lot of bullying going on, okay? So, uh, you know, in the light of hindsight, I wish I was born out here. I talk like an Aussie, if not always behave like one. Now, that might be quite a childish and immature way of looking at things. But... For a teenager who wanted to assimilate, and that was the key word in the 1950s, we worked very hard at that. And maybe, maybe, yeah, maybe the journey could have been a little easier for me. Hmm. If there was a movie about you, Frank, <laughs> yeah. who would play you in the movie? <laughs> oh, God, whatever, whatever answer I give you. <laughs> I wouldn't have wanted to be Captain Schultz from Hogan's <laughs> Heroes, no, because he's a bumbling fool. And I'm talking about accented people. Um, I wouldn't want it to be Arnie. I don't look like Arnie, you know, I'm not a Terminator. <laughs> yeah. Look, even, even it doesn't have to be an actor. The people that I enjoy are people like Roger Ferrer, Federer. Why? Talent, humility. That is an equation which I wish a few more people had. Mm. So, if he can act, play me. <laughs> <laughs> and his bank account would be nice too, wouldn't it? <laughs> well, yeah, yeah. I think so. Uh, if you could be anywhere in the world tomorrow, um, no restrictions, don't worry about finances or anything, where would you be? Who would you have with you? 
well obviously I would like to have my family and again an easy answer where would I like be near my family they live out here okay I go back to Germany every year I've been doing that for 20 years and because I have an auntie my age there and and I enjoy being in Germany I enjoy talking a bit of German again and so on but living there no mm. And unashamedly, and when people complain and, and whinge and whine out here, you don't know how well off you are. And I've been to a lot of places. And travelling being one of our passions anyway in the family. So I, I wouldn't want to live anywhere but here. And I've chosen Albury Wodonga. We've lived here since 1982. We've been to Hopeton, Warrnambool, Geelong, taught in Melbourne and wherever. Uh, coached in Singapore for a couple of years and, and, and on and on. But... You can't beat the Northeast, and I'm not just saying it because you know I live here now. That is a deliberate choice we made. Mm. There's plenty of people like you um, that say that. In fact, everybody, every month, that's pretty much what we come back to. You know, yeah, a lot yeah. of people have been lucky enough to expose yeah. to the world, but mm. it's a pretty special pocket that we live in. Well, like definitely. Um, have you got a chosen charity? A lot of people have something they particularly support. You seem like you know anybody who needs help is where you'd like to try yeah, to help out where you yeah. can, but is there anything yeah. that's uh, close or dear to you? No, there isn't. I tell you the type of charity and donation that I give uh, are, are for people, local people, number one. I'm very much local. And again, that's not meant to be noble. I know where my money goes. Mm. Uh, if people in the flood in Townsville, I think I denoted there, and bushfire, people that have misfortune and have taken whatever they have established in their journey of life and they have all of a sudden it's fallen over by dint of fact they had no share. People who have a child who may be disabled, you know, those sort of disadvantaged people. Not only disabled people, mm. but disadvantaged people. And I would be more inclined to help them. If we sat down again in five years from now, would you still be the loud coach helping people that need help uh, on the sidelines, on the pool deck? What will you be doing five years from now, do you think? In the future? Yeah, keep going as I'm going. Um, Hoping we, my wife and I work very hard and keeping fit. I think it's very important. Therefore, I mentioned to you before about movement. And I don't want mean to lecture people, but you know, if you want to live to, if you've been lucky enough not to fall to an illness, have a heart attack or whatever, I think you've just got to be mobile. You know, don't lie too long on the couch. You know, I love my garden. If I'm bored, I can't be indoors for longer than four or five hours at a time. <laughs> you know, so in five years' time, nothing changes. Maybe we'll move closer to where my daughters live. But at the moment, I don't want anything to change. You never know, they might move back to you. No, they won't move back, unfortunately. They're too committed. And I went to London to live. My other daughter went to London too. They're both back here now and we're enjoying the young yeah. and children now and I've got one daughter in Melbourne too. Excellent. Well, Frank Homan, it was lovely to learn a little bit about uh, your mm. story. Um, thank you so much for being fairly honest and, and you said, you know, I might feel like I'm lecturing or coaching but it sounds like it's, it's what you're good at so why wouldn't you do more of that? Yeah. <laughs> I don't know about that. I can always remember my father and my mother and father died unfortunately very young. I've always pitied my mother uh, simply because of lack of English and lack of, we talk about loneliness and whatever. Uh, and, and my father one day said to me, you know, don't use that teacher voice on me. And, and that was, you know, the lecture bit coming in. And I've done it all my life and I'm not going to change. <laughs> <laughs> Frank Homan, thanks so much for sharing part of your journey with us. I'm sure there's plenty more stories we could tell, but I okay. uh, appreciate the time you've given today. Thank you very much, Kevin. I've enjoyed talking to you. <laughs>